We are going to continue um, from chapter 6, talking about the brain, what role it has on our behaviour, whether we can actually blame it or not for our behaviour. Some of you are still speaking. Thank you. Okay. Um, Romans chapter 9, verse 20. I'm going to be jumping around a bit. I'm reading from the book, starting from, from page 55. So if you've got the textbook in front of you, it'll be a lot easier than turning your Bible. And I'm not going to hang about. So. Romans 9, 20. Nay, nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed him, Why hast thou made me thus? Shall we ask God, Why have you made me this way? Why am I built this way physically? Why is my brain the way it is? Question. Can man blame God or blame his brain for his behavior? No. I mean, clearly not. We heard some great portions from Pastor Steve on this. The world has a, obviously has a different view because they don't believe in responsibility. But if you could blame the brain that you were born with for your behavior, then you'd have a reason for blaming God. On the other hand, the brain does suffer physical damage. There are chemical imbalances. There are things that happen. There are real things and diseases that happen in here. So there must be something. So the implication from the world's perspective would be if there can be chemical imbalances, we should be able to blame the brain, right? But where does sin start from? The heart, right. Because you've all read the book. The heart and the brain. So, sinful. See, these things stick after a while. Sinful initiations, and then sinful behavior. Okay. So sin starts off in the heart and ends up in the brain. This means that if we didn't have the problem with the heart, Maybe the brain wouldn't have such a problem. It also means that the, the brain, one thing the brain does have is the ability to block sinful initiations. You see this in the world with good people who do good things but they're not saved, and so there's no credit for their good works. But it's possible, using the power of the brain to block the, the initiation of the heart, but it really doesn't change the fact that you're living from the old heart or unsaved. But that makes it look good on the outside, right? So people who are wired differently can, at least externally, appear to be different. Okay. So can the brain be blamed? And there's three categories. This guy, Ed Welsh from Philadelphia, he's a Christian counselor. He's Bible first, physiology second. If there's a contradiction or a seeming contradiction between the Bible and science, the Bible wins. And he wrote a book called Blame It on the Brain, where he makes three statements. There's a yes, but even that's qualified. There's a maybe. And there's an absolutely no. And I'm going to hit each of these three categories and the kind of things that happen. 
that, that, that kind of covered. So, first one is the yes. 2 Corinthians 4.16, I'm just going to read it. But thou art outward, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And this is talking about physical, externals. And he's saying, look, yeah, you can, in some situations, blame the brain for your behavior. Um, Pastor Steve spoke about Tourette's, Tourette's syndrome, where people, specifically that specific case where people just come out with foul language. But where does the foul language come from? The heart. And the whole thing with the guy with Tourette's syndrome is he's not able to deal with the fact that his heart is giving him the initiations. But it always goes back to the heart. And the other one, Alzheimer's, which is, you know, it's a degenerative disease. It's real. People become, as they get older, they become very forgetful. And needy. They can't do anything without other people helping them. Now, does that not seem a reasonable thing to say that the person with Alzheimer's has got no, no way around it? Well, maybe he just uses it as an excuse. Because sin is still sin. And if he's forgetful, needy, maybe he just says, you know what, I'm just going to let people take care of me. I'm just going to be, yes, I'm just going to use people. I'm going to allow myself to be the way I am. It is sin. Or can be. And I would never, you know, criticize people with Alzheimer's. It's a real thing. But we should also warn, we be wary that it can be used by that person with that disease to justify. And, you know, physical head injuries. As Pastor Steve talked about, Pastor Shabelli's brain being rewired. Somebody who has a you know, physical impact to the brain, brain can rewire. There's no reason that a head injury should, re should result in lifelong, personal, per permanent brain damage or permanent sin. There may be a de deficiency in, in mental capacity, mathematical capacity, memory, whatever. But sin is still sin, and sin can still be dealt with. I want to, you know, that to me is not such a big one. Um, the next one is the maybe category, and I think it gets more interesting. James 1, verses 2 through 4. I'm just going to open up with the first portion of it. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. My brethren, count it all joy. This is the maybe category, where it doesn't appear to be a physical degenerative problem in the brain, but maybe there's chemical things. Two of the biggest ones, actually three of the biggest ones, are depression, ADD, and bipolar. Depression. Um... We know people who are constantly depressed. It always seems like, you know, maybe people are depressed all the time. Do you think maybe there are people that enjoy being depressed? Do you think they're the woe is me? I'm going to hang out in my pigsty and wallow in the mud of my self-life. Do you think there's an element of selfishness in certain people who enjoy their depression because it gives them a right to be self? Step out, not, you know, snap out of it. You know, we've got to drag people out. I've been there. I, I, I've had moments where I really, really love being miserable. It brings me pleasure. And any time people try and drag me out of it, I say, no. I'm going to be miserable and grumpy 
and you can't do anything. And it's selfish, right? It's selfish. Um, maybe it's a male thing. Women often don't have, especially mothers, don't have this have this luxury. When the baby starts crying, they have to get up anyway, right? So, yeah, but you know, depression can be a very selfish thing. The other one is ADD, attention deficit order. The best known psychiatric diagnosis ever. If you've got a problem with your kids, someone will tell them they've got ADD. Well, maybe the reason they're not paying attention is they don't want to. Maybe they're just too preoccupied with their own self-life. You know, maybe the person who comes to church and doesn't want to listen to pay attention to the message is doing so because he, he or she has something else. You know, diagnosed? Yeah, it's, it's diagnosed because well, they, they can't think of anything better. It's like a catch-all for everything. Kids playing up, ADD. But, you know, there is a big selfish nature to it. The final one is in this category of the maybe, and I'll tell you why it's a maybe in a little while, is bipolar disorder. When I grew up, it was known as manic depression, mood swings. One moment you're feeling, you know, on top of the world, next moment you're feeling depressed. There is a, you know, there is a physiological basis for it. But do you think God could overcome it? Do you think you could, by faith, exercise James 1, count it all joy? Substance abuse is very big among people with bipolar disorder. Um, they, they do it because it seems to calm them down and they, you know, it makes them feel better. They don't feel so depressed and so miserable. And there is, there is certainly valid medication, although marijuana is not one of them, or alcohol. Those student days do not count as valid medication, but there certainly are valid medications. But really, the person who is like mood swinging for me one and the other, again, maybe he just needs to Take a step of faith and step out of self-life and start being, stop being selfish. I know it sounds easy, but people should try it. Now, the reason I say this is because, you know, yeah, there are chemical imbalances in the brain. And people, yes, Thomas? Yes. Is depression a sin? I wouldn't necessarily, I would not sit down and say it's always a sin. But maybe I would, I don't know. Because it's based on self. Anything based on self is sin, yeah. Can depression based in emotions, chemical imbalance, or the heart? Definitely, definitely the heart. Emotions will be impacted by depression more than anything else. Um, chemical imbalance is yes. But the heart is always a big deal. You know, and I, and I, you know, people who are depressed, I don't want to, you, you, you don't want to beat them up and say you just need to, but again, through love and through truth, the realization that they are living in a self-life, I can't think of any other reason. I don't think Jesus was ever depressed. I don't think he was. It could be a reason, chemical imbalances could be a reason that make you, makes you susceptible. And I'm going to hit this because I want, I want to be very cautious on this. I'll come, that, come to that at the end. But keep that, yeah, keep that thought. Um, yeah, chemical imbalances are a real thing and they can impact depression, but... They should never be seen as a root. Um, a lot of the time the issue really is a self-life a self -life problem. Now, the third one I'm going to really have fun with, it's uh, 
Can you blame the brain? And there's a big no. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But with but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Okay. Two things that the world says you can blame the brain for. They say they're illnesses. Well, the first one they'll say is an illness. The second one is an orientation. The illness, they say, is alcoholism. The orient orientation is homosexuality. They are wrong 100% on both cases. So we would say, can you blame the brain? And the answer is no. Okay. Going back to the earlier thought, that if you could blame the brain, you could blame God. So why, let's just take alcohol for a while, why do people partake of it? And is there a physical dependency? Yes, there is a physical dependency. There is a physical dependency, and people who have drunk for years and years heavily, people who have used drugs, yet yeah, there are cravings. But that doesn't last very long. If you were to ask a reformed alcoholic why he, why he didn't quit, it wouldn't be. If he was honest, it wouldn't be the answer. He wouldn't say, well, it's too tough. He would not honestly say it was because of the cravings and the withdrawal symptoms. The reason is, if he's honest, is he enjoys it. You know, and it's funny, it's not funny, but a ex-alcoholic who has been clean for years and years and years, in a moment, because he misses what he believed was fun in his life, he wants to get, he's quite happy to just get back in there and have a few beers and party it up. He's not addicted physically. He just enjoys the feeling of the sin of getting drunk. That's the way it is. It's just, you know. As I said, um, we, we should not ignore the fact that you know, alcohol for some is tough to give up. I mean, there are cravings, there are withdrawal symptoms. But the real question is, as with any other drug or any other sin, is this. Do people want to give it up? You want to give up smoking? Do you really want to give it up? Or are you just saying that to make people happy? You want to give up this, you want to give up that? Do you really want to? Can God help you? Yeah. Second one is homosexuality, which is not an orientation. Now, does the world, does much of science would totally disagree with this. Um, there have been pictures of brains taken. You know, a dead, when a heterosexual dies, and a homosexual dies, they take the brain, they slice it, and they look noticeably different. And Pastor Steve was talking about the, the neurons and the synapses and the way lines developed. So the pro-homosexual scientist, because that's his position, will say that his brain, because it's different, causes him to live that lifestyle. Is there an option B? What came first, the chicken or the egg? We don't know, do we? Pretty well the chicken, actually. I don't remember anywhere in the Bible saying God made eggs. <laughs> but could it be that the homosexual behavior forms lines in the brain and then forms the brain to, uh, to be, appear different? Yes, absolutely. 
What about genetics? I, you know, I, in my time, I have, you know, known many homosexual friends back in my old days, and I have no animosity. I just know they're wrong. But I've actually seen brothers who are both living in that lifestyle, and it seems genetic. But do you think maybe there could be a family basis? Could be peer pressure? Could it be that the environment that would make one person tend to go that way could affect the other person? And again, there's no excuse because we can always say no. Could it be? No physiological basis has ever been found for homosexuality. No gay gene has ever been found. There's a X and there's a Y and there's it's about as much as I know. So if you have questions, Dr. Chung can just fill you in on... And he knows more than I do, which is not very much. Yeah, it's no way. There's no homosexual gene, there's no gay gene. Could there be peer pressure? Could there be failure? Could you believe that a man who has problems with women might try it with men? I know somebody years ago who said that to me. Yeah, could be. Could be continued rejection might just mess people's up minds so much that they'll try something else. But it doesn't change the fact that it's sin and that it's the choice. Now, this leads us to the question, how, you know, why sexual sin is sexual sin, whether it's homosexuality, heterosexual, you know, adultery, fornication. Why, in a sense, does one person choose one over the other? And is there a difference? If I was to ask the men in this audience, including myself, if we've ever been tempted with lust after women, there wouldn't be an honest hand down. It's true, right? We know, we know that men are temp have that in us. Um, I think women do too, if they're honest. But most of us would never, we can't comprehend what it would be like to be attracted to another person of the same sex. It's so totally alien to us, which is sometimes a problem to us because we can understand and have compassion on somebody who somebody who's have, has the same problem with us, but someone who has a different problem, it's hard. And there aren't many people who've you know, suffered from homosexuality and come through it and have become ministers. There are a few and they're honest about it and it's an amazing testimony of God's grace. But it's important to understand that, st that while it's still sin, there's still a way out. There's still a way out. And you know, God died for that person's sins just as much as he died for my sins. And he can deal with that person's lustful attractions just as he can deal with mine. So the world would say, you know, you're born a homosexual. Okay, you can live that lifestyle because that's the way you are and we believe in freedom and liberty and we'll do whatever you want. No. But what about this? The guy that gets saved, he's gay. He goes to the church and someone says, I'm so glad you got saved. And you know that what you're doing is sin, right? And the guy says, yeah, I do. Don't know what to do about it, but I'm still having these urges, but I'm going to fight them. And the, guy, and, the, and, the, and the person in the church says, good, I'll help you fight your urges. And 20 years later, he has the same urges. And people think that's good. 
People think, oh, he's doing a good job. He's doing well. He's fighting his sinful urges. He knows he's a sinner, but he's fighting them. He's saved. That's awesome. Okay? Go back to the first hour. Synaptic pruning. Neuroplasticity. The renewed mind of Romans 12.2. God can and will rewire people. There are hundreds and thousands of Christians who grew up in a homosexual, uh, homosexual lifestyle, got saved, got delivered, got married to people of the opposite gender, and they have no desire to go back because God can deliver. Don't buy in this idea that, well, that's just the way your brain is, and it's sin, just get saved and fight your sin. No, 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 no. God can rewire the brain. Which is good, because otherwise, what a cruel lifestyle, what a cruel God it would be if he couldn't rewire us, if he couldn't fix us. Yeah, he has to destroy the old heart, but what a cruel God it would be if he couldn't deliver us from our sin. And it would leave us totally like... You know, get saved at 20, die at 70, 50 years of lust and no way of deliverance. Boy, that's not my God. That's the God of Islam. The God of Mormon It's not my God. He delivers us. He delivers us, you know. Mind renewal. <sighs> now, I just want to... Uh, Thomas made that comment about chemical imbalance. I just want to, do want to caution you on one thing. You know, we've brought out the principles here, very simply, and they're in the book, and if you, can, if you ever read Blame It on the Great Brain, Blame It on the Brain, it's a great book. But don't think that you're an expert. Don't ever think that you've taken Bible school, biblical counseling, fundamentals of counseling, now you know it all. Pastor Hadley has a master's or PhD. Master's. He'll be the first to say he doesn't know it all. Ed Welsh, he has Bible background and physiological background. There are times you have to refer people to professional counselors, and there are times when chemicals can help. There are times that just certain drugs can help to make a person more receptive. But it's a last resort. I mean, our elders would not ever preach against, would never say you should never use drugs for, legitimate drugs for these purposes. I've asked them. So, the final portion will be from Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. I'm not going to read the whole, all of them. But there's a word in that list, witchcraft. The Greek word for that is pharmakia, from where we get the word pharmacy. Drugs. Drugs, drugs, drugs are witchcraft. Drugs are of the devil. In page 1661, I've got a very brief list of kind of things that some of these things do. Um, and it, this list is very brief. It increases every single day. There are so many man-made drugs now being made that will do all sorts of crazy things to our brains. But it really is of the devil. It's not recreation. There's no such a thing as a recreational drug. When you allow LSD, marijuana, which are mind-altering hallucinogenic drugs into your mind, what you, you, know, you think those dreams come from nowhere? Maybe they come from the devil. I think maybe he's sending a few things into your mind, your brain, when you're... I know none of you do, but you know, people, when they take these, drink, these things, you think maybe Satan is planting a few thoughts, a few dreams. LSD, people have flashbacks 20, 30 years later. It's, it's, yeah, it's nasty. Um, you've got things like cocaine, which you know, people like it because it makes them confident. 
but it can it can cause insomnia, hallucin you know, hallucinations. A lot of these things that make people confident can also make people very paranoid because their confidence is based in a drug rather than in God. Um, so that really is a brief, brief overview of kind of you know, the, you know the brain's physiology. Yeah, you can blame the you can, yeah you can never really blame the brain for sin for for sin because it's a hard issue and you can relearn things and if you're prepared to humble yourself, there are people to help you. But it does go from a yes to a maybe to a no. Okay, so thank you for your time. God bless you. Have a great evening. Amen.